one we are life thank you a very good evening to all of you i on behalf of the indian society of cornea and keratin refractive surgeons welcome you all in this webinar wherein we'll be learning a few tricks about some important procedures and we have with us uh, professor jay tyal who is the president of iskaris and chief of rp center and he himself is very much academically oriented with numerous publications and awards and orations to his credit and he was the first indian to have performed live cataract acrs and has received the most coveted padma shri from government of india by the president of india it is a pleasure to uh, welcome our vice president uh, of indian society for cornea and keratin refractive surgeons dr rishi mohan who's passed out from rp center aims new delhi and uh, he has to his uh, credit a lot of uh, awards gold medals certificate of merits and uh, various uh, accolades and in the leadership program he's held uh, several positions which include the joint secretary of delhi ophthalmological society the president of delhi ophthalmological society member scientific committee member managing committee of uh, aios uh, joint secretary of eye bank of association of india and uh, treasurer of the same society Uh, so we welcome dr rishi mohan we also will be joined very shortly by the treasurer of iskaris dr rajiv mukherji who is the director and senior consultant mukherji eye clinic new delhi and he is also a visiting professor at pinburg school of medicine at usa he is an established cornea and facial surgeon has uh, numerous uh, presentations and papers to his credit both internationally and nationally so we welcome uh, dr rajiv mukherji It is a pleasure to introduce Dr. Susan Jacob, who needs no introduction. She is a international figure uh, in the field of uh, ophthalmology. Uh, she is director at Dr. Agarwal's uh, Refractive and Cornea Foundation, and uh, specializes specializes in cataract, glaucoma, cornea, keratoconus, and refractive surgery. And she has over 21 years of experience specializing in refractive surgery, cutting edge keratoconus management. advanced corneal transplantation complex anterior segment constructions glaucoma and complex cataracts i think uh, she is known for her innovations in ophthalmology in uh, all these uh, areas and recently she was selected to the power list of 2021 and annual list of top 100 women ophthalmologists in the world and formed part of a round table of five of the most influential women ophthalmologists internationally uh, not only amongst women i think amongst all ophthalmologists she will feature into the power list of uh, the uh, she she should be a part of the power list and she has numerous publications which are quoted very widely and which have made a lot of difference to the clinical practice and she is a world leader in the field of ophthalmology so it's a pleasure to have you susan today uh, we also have with us uh, uh, tonight dr himanshu matalia who is a senior consultant at naran netrale bangalore Yeah, he has been trained uh, at uh, various places. He has uh, got the ICO fellowship at the Wilmer Eye Institute, uh, uh, USA. He has got the super specialty fellowship in cornea and anterior segment at L V Prasad Eye Institute. Uh, I'm sorry, L V Prasad Eye Institute, uh, Hyderabad. Uh, he has also done masters in ophthalmology from uh, M P Shah Medical College, Jamnagar, and of course M B B S from there. He has numerous achievements and awards to his credit. has been the founding member and member executive committee of cornea society of india awarded best video by uh, european society of cataract and refractive surgeons awarded best research paper by asia pacific association of cataract and refractive surgeons best research paper by escrs invited faculty at reputed uh, you know flying uh, eye hospital orbis invited speaker uh, at multiple national and international conferences acclaimed teacher and mentor member editorial board of igo reviewer of many international and national journals and most importantly a very good teacher a very good academician when he when he when he explains something he it is he makes it very simple so it's a great pleasure welcoming dr himanshu matalia in this webinar again it's a pleasure to introduce uh, dr arup chakravarti the senior consultant at chakravarti i care center trivandrum a uh, graduate and post graduate graduate from jipmer pondicherry in 1990 fellow in iol and anterior segment microsurgery at arvindai hospital mudurai uh, currently the president of kerala society of ophthalmic surgeons uh, just uh, taken over last year he is also the uh, editor proceedings of all india ophthalmological society and is doing a great job 
uh, presented many papers and courses at international and national platforms and has been invited speaker at multiple national and international conferences. And of course, he's an acclaimed teacher, a true academician, mentor, and have trained multiple fellows from across the world. He's also the reviewer of many international and national journals. Uh, we welcome Dr. Arup Chakravarti. Apart from the three speakers, we have three eminent panelists as well. Uh, we start with Colonel Vijay Sharma, who is uh, currently professor and senior advisor of thermology and cornea, cataract and refractive surgery, Command Hospital, Calcutta. He has done his uh, training from AFMC Pune, uh, both MBBS and MS, and then he has done the cornea and refractive surgery uh, training at RP Center Ames for two years. Uh, he has numerous awards to his credit, and uh, uh, some of which, uh, one of which is, of course, the Young Achiever Award at the East Coast Annual Conference. He is a part of editorial board of uh, various journals, and uh, uh, like uh, you know, M. Jaffe, IGO, BGO, etc. He is a reviewer of various journals, and has numerous publications to his credit, more than uh, close to hundred. I would say he's written six or seven here. And uh, four new surgical techniques. He has 12 book chapters. He has one textbook to his credit. And it has been great pleasure working with him at RP Center. Uh, personally, he's a very dear friend, very uh, good colleague, and an excellent surgeon and a very good academician. So we welcome Colonel Vijay Sharma. It's a pleasure to welcome our dear friend, Dr. Anjum Mazari, senior consultant and head Indira Gandhi Eye Hospital and Research Center, Lucknow. Uh, areas of interest are refractive surgery, uh, uh, cross-linking, and lamellar corneal transplantation. And he has, to his credit, numerous achievements. India's top 100 MSME award in 2020, India's signature brand award in ophthalmology category, healthcare excellence award in 2019-2020, primetime global icon award, achievement award from SightLife for the highest number of corneal transplants by an individual in 2015. And I think that is a great fit. Um, he has, to his credit, many publications and presentations in the international and national conferences. And we look forward to hearing from you, Dr. Anjum Masari. Thank you. We also have with us Dr. Jitter Bhalla, who is a senior consultant and academic in charge of DUI Hospital, uh, DDU Hospital New Delhi. Uh, he has special interest in cataract and glaucoma with publications in uh, peer-reviewed journals. He is currently the Secretary of uh, Delhi Ophthalmic Society and Member Scientific Committee of AIOS. He is also Chairman Scientific Committee uh, ISM SICS Delhi Chapter and has numerous awards to his credit like IRSI Gold Medal, RN Sabrawal Gold Medal, DMA Appreciation Award, Achievement Award by uh, Iskares, OphthaQuest. He has received the Best Paper Award and AC Agrawal Trophy by DOS in 2018 and Best Paper Award in uh, a couple of more annual DOS conferences. He has received a Distinguished Resource Teaching Award by DOS on numerous occasions and has been a part of reviewer panel of various national and international journals. He is truly a very good academician, has very good inputs in most of the webinars. We welcome Dr. J.S. Bhalla in this webinar. Mm -hmm. We have with us Professor Namrata Sharma, who is a co-moderator. Of course, he needs no introduction. She is, the, she is Professor of Ophthalmology at RP Center in the cornea section, and uh, she is chairperson, scientific committee, uh, ISCRS, secretary AIOS, regional secretary, Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology, secretary I Bank Association of India. Numerous publications, many uh, chapters, textbooks, truly a very good academician and uh, a, a source of inspiration, I would say. And of course, I'm Dr. Rajesh Sinha, working at RP Center and on regional secretary ISCRS. So before we actually go to the uh, scientific program, I'll request our uh, president, Professor Tital, to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Rajesh. Indeed, uh, the Friday, uh, we all look forward to uh, listening to a very eminent uh, faculty of our country who have been a flag bearer of uh, country's academic program world over. And it's true today also looking into uh, three of the most eminent uh, speakers with us today in our uh, Iskeres uh, webinar today. We are definitely going to learn many, many things, the tips and tricks in uh, these important procedures. And not only us, the people are going to join us uh, through various uh, or, uh, ways to uh, getting uh, 
integrated to this webinar. People are going to enjoy this uh, session. I'm pretty sure the uh, discussion which is going to happen will be fruitful to all of us. And I welcome uh, all the speakers, the panelists, and the people uh, who are making this program so lively. Dr. Rajesh, Namrata, Rajiv, Rishi. We are really thankful to them for making uh, every Friday so uh, enjoyable in learning and getting our best people uh, to be interacting with the people of our society. Thank you uh, all of you and let's have the, uh, the you know, program running in a way which we have been doing for last so many, so many weeks and months. Thank you, Rajesh. Thank you, sir. So we begin the first talk and that will be by Dr. Susan Jacob and she'll be talking about CARES. This uh, subject is very close to her heart and uh, she, she really is an innovator in this field. So let's hear from her uh, regarding CARES. Uh, thank you so much uh, to everyone at ISCRS. Uh, this is possibly the first time I'm presenting here in this really august uh, society and I'm really honored to be here. Uh, among such stalwarts, actually, it's uh, really great to see the screen and see such uh, uh, big people whom I've looked up to uh, for many, many years uh, and uh, being able to present here is really an honor. So thank you once again for having invited me. Uh, everyone at Express, uh, Dr. Jeevan Tityal, Dr. Namrata Sharma, ma'am, thanks for that very wonderful introduction that you gave me. Though I'm sure I'm not <laughs> deserving of what you said, but still, so thank much. you so much. You're far ahead of me in the road. Uh, thanks, Dr. Rajesh, for having invited me. Uh, and uh, everyone else who's here, uh, Dr. Bhalla, and everyone else from Express, thank you. And it's nice to also see old friends like Anjum and uh, uh, Dr. Rajesh and everyone else here. Thank you so much. I'll just uh, share my screen. So, my talk is on CARES, uh, which stands for Corneal Allogenic Intrastromal Ring Segments. Um, is my voice being heard? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, the, yeah, the CARES is an acronym that I coined for Corneal Allogenic Intrastromal Ring Segments, and it uh, uh, basically, uh, as the name implies very clearly, it stands for intrastromal ring segments, which are made out of allogenic tissue. The source of allogenic tissue could actually be anything. Uh, Corneoscleral rim is what we started off with because that was most easily available. But uh, as the term implies, it could be fresh processed preserved tissue or allogenic tissue of any other source. And so it's quite an all encompassing term, uh, which could mean any allogenic tissue again. So I must say at, at the outset that I do have a patent pending for some of these uh, trefines and devices. Uh, and uh, with that, I will go on to my talk. We know that the current treatment of keratoconus uh, is uh, very commonly uh, what's being done by almost all the corneal specialists is corneal cross-linking. Uh, but uh, corneal cross-linking as such, even though it's fantastic as far as uh, progression of, uh, or as far as limiting the progression of keratoconus is concerned, the role that it plays in regularized, regularizing corneal topography or improving vision is limited. It does cause some amount of flattening, but probably not to the extent we all hope for in a keratoconic patient. And so often, uh, if we just cross link the patients, uh, they're uh, not that happy with their vision, even though we may be able to stop their progression. And uh, one of the big causes for decrease in vision, of course, we know is irregular astigmatism. And it's often uh, been very commonly treated with uh, synthetic intrastromal corneal ring segments for many years now. Uh, Joseph Collin had started its treatment for keratoconus and before that it was even attempted to be used for myopia. But uh, with, once it was introduced for keratoconus, the ICRS, synthetic ICRS actually became very popular because uh, they did cause quite a significant improvement in vision and the commercially available ones include uh, Intax, Kerara, Kerara rings, Ferrara rings, Myo rings, Bysantis segments and many of these uh, other uh, similar ones. The one thing that's common to all of these, of course, is that they're all made of artificial segments, that is of PMMA. So even though they improve uh, quality of vision, they can sometimes be dangerous as uh, seen in this uh, big collage of uh, complications that I have here. Uh, they're all from my own series. Uh, you can see that there's overriding and uh, of the segments which uh, led, uh, you know, where there was migration with time and uh, you can see on the ASOST also overriding, uh, extrusion, very common intrusions have been reported in literature, even leading on to high drops, acute high drops. Uh, and uh, all these things are really common, even uh, going to the extent of uh, infectious keratitis, uh, therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty and so on. 
So uh, this was uh, when, you know, I used to like the effect of uh, synthetic ICRS, but not the complications. And I was wondering what we could do about this. And that's when I had the idea about using allogenic implants uh, in the form of uh, corneal allogenic interstromal ring segments. And I thought about this in 2015. We started out in 2015. We then went on and published a series in the Journal of Refractive, and, uh, Refractive uh, Surgery. And as I uh, said, allogenic would mean anything. This is the double-bladed refine that we use to make these segments. Uh, so there's often a big uh, you know, confusion about whether this is smile lenticular implantation or whether you're doing uh, a full implantation beneath a flap or a cap, but that's not what it is. Uh, if you uh, want to very simply understand, it's just basically allogenic intacts or allogenic ICRS. So you've got this uh, double bladed trephine with which you can punch out uh, tissue. You could also make these with femtosecond uh, laser assisted cares and uh, uh, really it's now uh, being done in Australia and some other countries where, fem where femtosecond assisted uh, care segments are being prepared and then implanted. And uh, there have also been publications with this now uh, where they adopted the technique from us. So uh, here is uh, the way that uh, we started off with, but as I said, this is not a limiting way. That's the uh, con donor conuscital rim and the epithelium and the endothelium are completely removed from this. The trephine that I showed you earlier is used to punch out the segment. It can then be cut into the desired uh, length and then uh, these are simple instruments uh, fashioned from your own cataract set but they're also available from epsilon to buy if anyone's interested in it i have no uh, financial interest uh, with these instrument sets uh, this these are then uh, implanted into the uh, segments into the femtosecond laser dissected channels that are prepared on the patient's uh, cornea and uh, and then you can go ahead and cross-link the patient also either simultaneous or sequential if the patient per keratoconus or the ectasia is, ectasia is progressive. If not, you can leave it at that. So here is a post-operative, uh, you know, uh, slit lamp image, which shows a very quiet eye, as you can see, and midstromal implantation in the form of, a, of two a double segments, two arcs, actually. And if you see on uh, diffuse slit, imag uh, uh, slit imaging, you can see the two segments that are implanted in the mid-periphery. And uh, these are what give you the effect of the uh, allogenic ring segments. Some of the post-operative images you can see here, 50% depth of implantation, which is very different from intacts, which is implanted about 70 to 80% depth. Again, the anti-segment OCT images showing you the 50% depth and uh, good integration. And this, these are uh, light microscopic images of the segment showing good uh, regular orientation of the lamellae. What are the disadvantages of synthetic segments? It's not just the complications that we mentioned previously. It's also the fact that you cannot implant it in very thin corneas or very steep corneas, steep corneas, more than 58 diopters. So if you look at all the surgeons who are doing synthetic ICRs, they generally keep a cutoff of 58 diopters. And uh, also this uh, thickness uh, cutoff is there. And that's because uh, if you go uh, to extremes that have more than this, uh, the patient ends up uh, for sure with complications. So you're kind of limited in what you can, in, in the, um, the uh, severity of patients to whom you can offer synthetic ICRS. And also because you're, uh, you know, implanting it deep, there's a limited effect to the amount that you, there's a uh, limitation to the amount of effect that you get can get from synthetic ICRS, which is not there for cares, because you can implant this at 50%, 30%, whatever you want, though we generally keep it as 50%. And of course, uh, you also have different, uh, you know, set thicknesses, set arc lengths, Etc. for synthetic segments, whereas that limitation is not there with CARES. So uh, CARES not only avoids the complications, it can also be advanced, uh, implanted in much more advanced cases, much more milder and earlier cases as well. So it's not just that the bad cases can be implanted with it, you can even implant it in early cases. And as I said, more superficially, and you can, you can customize it greatly as you'll see it uh, in my presentation. Some of the examples of advanced cases, uh, you can see here, a uh, really advanced case with about uh, 72 diopters, Seen here, I think Kmax was about 76, if I remember right. We've got about 30 to 25 diopters of flattening here in the difference map. Post-operative, a much more regular cornea. And even up to, you know, uh, diopteric powers of 44, 47, very close to normal, 41 diopters. And uh, and the, the shine fluke showing the great uh, decrease in the ectasia that can be seen when you keep it as uh, centered on the lens, front surface of the lens. Now, here's another advanced case. Again, you can see uh, steepening... Uh, uh, which which has been flattened out and you've got good uh, central topography, a lot of flattening and the vision actually improved from 624 to 69 and uh, the patient very happy. We used a very small optic zone of about 4 mm in this case and uh, this is of course the patient looking down slightly. But one of the advantages that you have with CARES is that the patients really don't complain too much about uh, edge glare effects as they would complain with the intact. So 
so that's another big advantage over uh, synthetic segments that you don't have uh, a lot of optic phenomena with cares. You can also put it in thinner cases. Uh, as you can see, this patient who had a very localized area of 230 microns, uh, we implanted CARES. This was a patient with cerebral palsy. We did, instead of doing a DALC, which he otherwise would have been suitable for, we did a CARES and we could, uh, you know, get him off the requirement for prolonged uh, uh, post-operative follow-ups, future adjustments, uh, you know, all those complicated, all those uh, problems were avoided and he still continues to do well. He's a share broker and he's still in, uh, very active in the share market. So it's not just keratoconus, but also other conditions such as corneal ectasias, irregular corneas, and also not just those, but also as treatment for synthetic segment complications. This is a patient who had a post intact melt and I've treated with, with uh, you know, in removal of the intacts, which was here and uh, implantation of a care segment in that space instead with the, uh, you know, uh, the retention of the vision and the topographic improvement also. And I'm very happy to say that CARES is now being done in multiple centers other than India. There are about two or three centers in US now uh, with big numbers there. And also uh, many of the US IBANs are also starting to offer CARES as pre-cut and uh, pre, uh, you know, uh, ready to use uh, segments now in US, Canada. There are two centers, including three, I think, including University of Toronto, um, Australia, it's already being done, South Africa, Turkey, Island Killage is doing it, Israel, Lebanon, Dominican Republic, Germany, Pakistan. So there are really many, many people who are now uh, uh, doing CARES and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, adoption by corneal surgeons, as well as even by patients who hear from word of mouth uh, and with patients coming in directly asking for this uh, treatment is also increasing. This is the patient who had the post intact smell, just to show you how you can also use it for these kind of surgeries. You remove the outer and the uh, inner segments of the cut cornea so that you have only that ring of tissue. Uh, that's the intact melt. remove all the epithelium and you see that the area of melt is larger and then you can just explant it out and then cut the care segment to the desired length. And if you want, you can thin it out a little bit if you want to, and then you can put it in and put anchoring sutures on both sides, bridging sutures over the top. And you can put in some glue so that put some glue over it so that there's no chance of any epithelial ingrowth because this is a more irregular cornea in that area, cover with the bandage contact lens and you have a very good positive outcome. And that's the patient, same patient which I shown earlier also, post-suture removal. And now we have also have a series which has just got accepted for publication on the use of CARES for post-synthetic segment ICRS melt uh, as part of a multi-center series. So again, Shaimfluk image is showing the flattening, uh, which you can get with CARES, uh, different topographies where you can see uh, here we've used larger optic zones, but also look at the difference in thickness uh, between the right eye and the left eye. The left eye are very thin segments, right eye are thicker segments. And you get got a sea, sea of flattening uh, with, with you know, opposing uh, axis of uh, steepening. And that's what you get. So this was a preoperative steep axis. So you've got a flattening in the pre-op steep and a steepening of the preoperative flat, which leads to an overall regularization, decrease in the sphere, cylinder, and an improvement in uncorrected and discorrected visual acuities. The patient was happy with this eye and that she opted to go for the left eye as well, which had a much milder uh, uh, keratoconus. And uh, she also underwent uh, thinner segments there with a lesser amount of flattening. So that's how you can customize it uh, using the optic zones, using the thickness of the segments implanted. Here's a patient who went underwent cares and cross-linking in one eye, only cross-linking in the other eye. And you can see cross-linking alone really is not giving you much effect, whereas cares has given you flattening. She was so happy with the right eye. She came back a year later because now she wanted cares to be implanted in the left eye also. She, hadn't, she was uh, not uh, able to afford it the first time around. She came back and we did a cares for the left eye also, and then we got a flattening and improvement in UCBA and BCBA here also. Some other topographic uh, pictures showing the flattening, decrease in the cylinder, uh, you know, overall improvement in the topography, regularization of the cone. You can put, you know, almost fully circular segments. This is about 330 degrees segments, uh, which go all around. So a lot of customization possible. Here's our asymmetric segments, one thick and one thin. And uh, you can see the, again, what I mentioned earlier, flattening, which is, maximum in the preoperative steep axis and a much better regularization of the cone and values that are near normal 44.5, 43.1 and so on. And as I said, you don't have any symptoms of glare or other photic phenomena. Uh, you can put single segment cares as seen here and you can get the flattening just above the uh, segment. The little bit of steepening that you can often see compensatory steepening, which gives you this overall regularization. Uh, so that's the flattening, a little bit of compensatory steepening on the opposite axis. Uh, an improvement in uncorrected and best corrected visual acuity. And you can see that uh, here's another patient with a single segment, a longer segment this time. And we've got about 14 days after the flattening 
uh, it was uh, about you know KMAX would have been more than this of course here chose 76.3 but uh, we've got it down a stage singer who went back to uh, singing on the stage without his glasses and was very happy this patient incidentally is from Calcutta so here's another patient again single segment cares thinner segment this time and so you can see that we've got a milder amount of flattening but the uh, area of flattening again you can see is just above the segment uh, longer segments and you know now that Kera rings are also available as asymmetric ICRS where you can have different kinds of uh, progressive thicknesses so you can have a thickness that's thicker in one axis thins out to the other axis you can have segments that are thicker in the center or that are thinner in the center and towards the edges and and, but the problem with these are, these are one, they're synthetic. Second, you get it only in these fixed sizes. So you have this five millimeter and six millimeter optic zones. You have only 160 degrees and you have only these fixed thicknesses, 150, 250, and 300. So here's uh, what we can do with CARES. We can do a uh, tapered segment CARES uh, also, which you can greatly customize for your patient's topography. So you can see here, it's actually uh, thick, thick on one side and it's tapered out on the other side. And uh, we can, you know, we're now doing a series on this and uh, I'm happy to say that the results are very good customizing it uh, according to the topography of your patient. And you can insert it in there. Simple insertion basically is really, the learning curve is also not really too much. And so you can do a, a, a single segment care there. And here's uh, the centrally tapered cares, a different variety where you can have a central taper as seen here. And uh, uh, you can also see here a uh, central tapering and so you can get a little bit of less flattening in the center and more flattening in the periphery. As you can see here in this uh, picture where there's more flattening in the periphery where the segments are thicker. Uh, the densitometry showing you the uh, centrally tapered care segment. You can again have a single taper, single side taper segments as seen here. And you can have, as you see, flatter, the more flattening in the uh, area of uh, the thicker segment and less flattening as you go towards the thinner part. And you can see exactly how it mirrors the uh, topography that we wanted to correct. So that's that's really, you can actually do spot customization uh, at, at the time of surgery, you know, and you can really uh, not be limited by what is on offer uh, on your shelf. Here you have uh, segments that have put tapering to both sides. One is long and one is small. And accordingly, we've got the effect on this side and uh, a much better uh, topography postoperatively, as you can see here. Again, customization, a different case where it's thick on one side, tapered on one side, and corresponding uh, change in uh, topography with a compensatory steepening on the other side. Uh, a long single tapered segment seen here. Uh, and here, this is the edge where it tapers out. So uh, uh, really, uh, there's so much that you can do with this. All of these are again tapered segments. Uh, here is uh, the visual improvement, 618 to 69, and the sphero cylinder also comes down, uncorrected and best corrected both. And you can see the anti-segment OCT of these tapered segments, as you see, 263 microns at this axis. And as you go down uh, anti-clockwise, you can see the thickness is decreasing, 387, 403, 519, and so on. So here's another example where uh, it's uh, 365 at the bottom over here. And as you go to the upper part, it's about 120, 172 microns. So that's how we can actually taper it. You can also have both ends tapered uh, very quickly. I'll just show this. Uh, so this is a segment where both ends are tapered and we wanted this because we wanted maximum flattening here, just below the larger uh, you know, uh, part of the bow tie. And uh, so we implanted this. And uh, again, different, different uh, morphologies. So we do look at the phenotype of the keratoconus also and implant. Uh, this is one of the patients where we implanted a centrally tapered cares and you can see the difference in pachymetry on the uh, MS-39. Um, so um, here's a patient where we've got, uh, you know, we've implanted uh, long cares and we've got in the maximum area of uh, steepening, uh, which was about nine to six, uh, the K-max was 109 and we've got about 34, 40 diopters of flattening here. Again, shine flug images showing the flattening. So these are just various cases, which I can just keep on showing you for uh, ever, you know, actually two point to the, the coma is something that can really be decreased to a large extent with care. So here's one where you see 2.467 and it's decreased down to 0 0.764. So there's a lot of improvement in the visual quality of the patient postoperatively. Uh, this is an analysis software that, uh, sometimes used for analyzing the uh, patients. And this is by my good friend Shady Award. We, of course, uh, you know, publish this in JRS. Uh, we also use, uh, we also use progressive care for post elastic ectasia. And this was a case that I had recently uh, also shared uh, in some of the groups. And uh, so the patient footed extremely well. 
So Kiaz is really a better alternative to DALC for many reasons because uh, DALC is uh, something that is a one-time procedure. You can't really reverse it, whereas Kiaz can be reversed. It can be uh, you know exchanged. It can be uh, enhanced. You can uh, adjust its uh, position in the channel. There's so much that you can do with Kiaz, and you can combine it with cross-linking so that you get good effects. Uh, Many of the patients with advanced keratoconus would require transplantation earlier in life if you're doing a DALC, and that graft may not last for, last for their whole life. So it's really uh, nice to have uh, something else which you can do before going on to a DALC, and CARES really gives you that opportunity to not go in for a DALC straight away. DALC, of course, is a beautiful surgery. I don't deny that, but it can also be associated with a lot of complications, and we all know that it has a long learning curve, which is not the case with CARES. CARES is a simple surgery. It's got an easy learning curve, and the patients respond well. And of course, it's based on the Barakas law. We all know that uh, bioptics is something that you can do combined with this. In Australia, there's planning to start uh, one of the centers is planning to start care so that you can they, and then followed by topo guided PRK so that they don't have to remove as much of uh, tissue post uh, the, the topo for the topo guided PRK as they would have had to do otherwise. In combined fake ICL RLE, uh, you know, conductive keratoplasty if that's still around and other things. As I said, it's reversible and adjustable, so that's a big advantage. This is one of the patients who uh, we had to remove the cast because uh, she was not happy with the vision and then we implanted another one. This was removed, uh, I think, three or four days later and you can see uh, it came out relatively easily. Uh, we can also rotate it, as I said. So it, just, it does uh, get uh, adhered uh, reasonably uh, well within uh, a few days. So you can see here, in this case, we had a little more difficulty in getting it to uh, rotate, but we are able to do that and we make it go forwards and then uh, push it off uh, so that you ultimately get it to a position that's uh, in a different axis because we wanted to uh, change it. We were not happy with the initial axis. You can also be here. I had one patient who progressed, I rubber, young girl, where I had to do a DALC on CARES. And as I said, it doesn't prevent you from doing uh, DALC. Here's a, I was trying to remove one of the CARES. Uh, you don't necessarily need to do it, but I wanted to see how, how much it adheres. You could have done the DALC without removing. So on one side, I've not removed the CARES. On the other side, I'm attempting to remove the uh, cares and you can see it's just like these are lenticules actually uh, it's ad adhered at the edges but once you free those edges it really uh, comes out very beautifully so a little bit of uh, you know moving it around to get it to come free and once it's freed up in the channel you can just uh, just actually just pull it out so as i said it is reversible this was a year later this patient had uh, was a north indian who was who came back after the surgery a year later and uh, uh, for her follow-up and since we found it had progressed we went ahead and did a DALC and as you can see we did a big bubble DALC nothing to stop you from doing any of the conventional procedures so that's the in, in remove cares on one side the in, still retained cares on the other side I sent this tissue for biopsy and it came out as normal uh, corneal tissue with no changes no inflammation or anything of that sort and that's the post-operative day one appearance this is a, a microscopy of the uh, patient's cornea and the other fragment also shows uh, collagenous, no evidence of edema or inflammation, as I said. Uh, the segment really doesn't change in uh, thickness with time. And these are, you know, serial uh, scans, which have shown us uh, no change in segment thickness. Uh, this, these are over a uh, more number of years, 2019 to 2021. And we also have more than that, 4.5 years later, where again, the measurements remain the same. So uh, some of the advantages are the visual access is clear. I think I will come to the end of my present. I am at the end of my presentation. Uh, it's uh, got a lot of advantages as mentioned here and a very low level of rejection because of all the reasons that I've mentioned in innumerable uh, presentations. Uh, I think with that, I will come to the end of my talk. Thank you so much once again for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Susan, for uh, not only for a wonderful presentation, but also for introducing this wonderful technique. Uh, I would like to have comments from Dr. Vijay Sharma and then, of course, we can have a discussion. I think, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, before the talk, I had many doubts, but so many things have got cleared after this uh, presentation. Uh, I just want to ask, ma'am, uh, uh, whether she had any episode of uh, CARES rejection and if so, how, how did she manage that? In yeah. Her yeah, actually, uh, 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 me and uh, Jack Parker from US, we had at some time back, we had a combined case series of, I think it was about uh, 300 or something. But anyway, we, I don't remember the total number, but when we calculated it, we had a uh, rejection. We had one case of rejection, which worked out to be a 0.5% uh, incidence of rejection, which is much, much lower than uh, DAL, which is way lower than DAL. 
And we know that DALC itself, we are really not as conjunct surgeons that bothered about rejection as we are with penetrating keratoplasties or endothelial keratoplasties. So that particular case presented to Dr. Parker's clinic actually with some amount of uh, vascularization, some pain, uh, mild pain actually, not very severe. And when he saw, he saw this vascularization and uh, he started the patient on steroids and it responded very fast. So that was the only single case that we've seen of, uh, of rejection presenting with pain and things like that. But as I have also said, even if it rejects, it doesn't matter because the segment is outside the visual axis. So that's one of the advantages as compared to other techniques of uh, addition, addition keratoplasties, for example, slack and other techniques where you have the lenticule covering the pupillary axis also. In those cases, rejection becomes significant, but not in case of cares. In my presentation, I actually also had uh, uh, some of the uh, pictures of a patient showing how cosmetically it is not visible when you look at the patient and, uh, and as contrasted to intact, where sometimes you can see that glint. With cares, you cannot make out uh, that the patient has had an implantation. Okay. Uh, I have another question, ma'am. That question is regarding any customization in different grades of keratoconus, like in mild or severe. So about the thickness and uh, how, how do you titrate it? Uh, in any particular alg algorithm you have for that or uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's a nomogram that uh, we've, uh, we've almost kind of uh, we're finishing working upon and we are, we'll probably send that out for publication soon. Uh, but uh, it's basically based on the thickness of the tissue and the optic zone. Uh, generally, we tend to use smaller optic zones, not large optic zones so that we get more effect. If you have a milder case of keratoconus, you could uh, spot your optic zone a bit more and use thinner tissue. So you can just cut the tissue into uh, two halves if you have a, a case that's not as uh, severe. And uh, for more thicker case uh, uh, segments, when you put, you can uh, do really advanced cases also. And as I said, the customization also, you can vary depending on the arc length that you've used. And also, uh, like I showed you, the tapering of the segment. So you can you have different parts of the segment tapered. And that's something new that we've been doing for some time now, but uh, probably we'll send out for publication soon, which is basically tapered segment cares, customized to quite an extent. Okay. And another, uh, I think, uh, uh, the thing is about volume addition changes over a period of time. I think you had told that there is not much. Uh, like how many percentage of the thickness or decrease in the thickness of the uh, cares occur over a period of time. Now you have around four to five years of uh, uh, follow-up patients. Yeah. So we've got uh, we've got about five years of follow-up. Uh, we are, I I have not got the entire to be frank I have not got the entire data out. But the cases that I am seeing, uh, you know, a small a reasonably small number of cases or a reasonably large number of cases, I would say, which I have studied, we are not having too much change at all. Now, I don't know why that happened because I know in DALC it starts to compact out, in DZIC it starts to compact out. Why does it not compact out as much with CARES? I don't know the answer to this, but Mario Nubail who does SLAC has also reported similar results that it doesn't compact out. Now, is it because of the intrastromal location? The other place it's exposed to air on one side and uh, you know the aqueous on the other side, maybe that's the reason. Or maybe it's because in most of the cases, we combine it with cross-linking. So maybe cross-linking is freezing the tissue in place. That's something that's different as compared to DZEC or DAL. And, um, you know, uh, so those are some of the reasons that I can think of. But uh, generally, you know, shape change also is is uh, is more of a, it's not a mathematical calculation per se. So I, it really doesn't matter. Uh, you cross-linking it, it gets stabilized. The whole cornea gets stabilized. And then you have to look for an overall progression. The, the shape change due to the thinning of the segment, I have not really seen. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. I think it was very enlightening talk and uh, this is another shot in the uh, armamentarium of creative bonus uh, management uh, for the ophthalmologist. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Vijay. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a question, same question actually by Dr. Sharad Patil regarding rejection. So you have already answered and regarding thinning also, which already you have commented and perhaps you will be, you know, getting to know more about it once you, you know, completely analyze the data. Regarding the intrastomal uh, presence of the tissue, because of that, if uh, uh, I don't know whether thinning is uh, not happening because of that, because uh, what uh, I am doing a study where an intrastomal lenticule is being implanted, therein also I've seen that the thickness reduces with time. So maybe there are some other factors that are, uh, you know. Maybe it's cross-linking also, because a majority of my cases are cross-linked. So maybe that that is the fact. As I said, I am not sure why it's not changing so much. Yes. You know, this is so something when, very. When you, when you started out true. with the when you started out with cares at that point, I think you would not be cross linking. Cares came first or cross linking? You know. No, came. no, ma'am. Cross linking was already there. You were always combining it with cross linking. Almost always. Very few cases which were non progressive cares the cases have I ever done just plain cares alone. But the, by far the large large majority is with cross linking. What about those this, cases where 
cross linking has already been done and yet it's going on progressing uh, can it be used as a modality for a repeat kind of a post in post uh, cross linked corneas we have done it ma'am uh, yeah we have done it in a few cases but as i said the large majority of our cases are with cross linking there are few cases one for, uh, the cases that we've done differently are uh, we've tried it out on pellucid marginal degeneration we've done it on post lasic ectasias uh, we've done it for uh, as you said post cross linked corneas and also older patients who are uh, not progressing even if they were not cross linked who who are who just keratoconus has stopped progressing so those are the other kinds of cases that we've also extended cares to i think we do yeah. need to come out with a definite algorithm as to this should be the thickness this should be the taper this should be the length you know like yeah kind of uh, with the synthetic uh, because it's being done by the industry so with the synthetic uh, intracorneal ring segments they there this thing is fixed you know although the options are also limited so because you have wider options i think it will be uh, it will be and to see an algorithm more. and it will have wider uh, uh, you know choices also Yeah. So you probably would need to, you know, standardize that for us. I mean, you of course, but, yeah. But for others, uh, it should be reproducible. Uh, yeah. Same extent. I Susan, I just had a question, uh, if I may. It was a wonderful yes, talk. Yes. Sorry, I missed the first bit, but it's always nice to have uh, an innovation, and always nice to see the outcomes uh, from that. Um, so I was looking at the depth at which you implant the segment, uh, and. Uh, i was wondering how that uh, would what would be the ideal depth i mean uh, would deeper be more effective or remaining superficial be more effective or does that change it significantly so we keep it at uh, around 50% actually what i do is if I, i if you go too superficial you start to have irregularity of the surface so too superficial is also not good you And need to deep? have some amount of because with intacts need... uh, they generally go to 70 80% leaving about 100 uh, microns at the back So, yeah we don't go to 70 80% for multiple reasons one we found that we start we don't have effect uh, when you go too deep you still do have effect it's not that you don't have effect but the effect does decrease whereas with uh, 50% uh, thickness your effect really comes out a lot and in fact we've seen that in many cases it's much more than intact also but uh, uh, one thing is if you start going too superficial then what happens is you can have a bumpiness or an irregularity of the surface which we want to avoid so what i do is 50% and that is 50% of stroma so you remove the epithelial thickness because epithelium is a little variable in the keratoconic patients and then take 50% of the stroma and then when you put the laser setting what i do is 50% stroma thickness plus i just add a approximate value of 50 for my uh, epithelium 50 microns and put that as the depth About sixty the, percent, then uh, essentially that will be about sixty percent of the total, then more or um, less. I I I just do fifty percent stroma plus fifty microns, whatever that okay. comes to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor Anju, please. You have to unmute yourself. One thing: can we do if we want more flattening? Can we do the pre-soaking of the lenticule in the riboflavin and then do the cross-linking to it? Yeah, when we started out, that's what we had done. Actually, we were doing that in the very beginning, where we would uh, soak the cornea. Especially many of these cases, we do CAC exil. So, are uh, the lenticule, the contact lens, everything? We would just soak and then put it in. The thing is that when you do that, uh, there are two options of doing it. One is you cross, you also cross link before you put into the cornea. But we found that to be maybe it's possibly yeah you can do it. These are different things that you can do. But we would just put the riboflavin soaked uh, segment inside and then cross link everything at the same time, the cornea and the riboflavin segment. The only thing is when you do have riboflavin soaked segments it becomes a little more slippery because riboflavin you know it's a dextran based probably uh, you know uh, isoton hypotonic may not be slippery but we used to use a dextran based one that's more slippery so it's a little more difficult to uh, push it into the seg- uh, this thing so have you compared the now, result without soaking and with soaking uh, i have not actually micro compared it to that extent uh, uh, but i off the top of my head i feel that there may not be any difference uh but um uh yeah what i do now is i dehydrate the segment and that's basically described that that modification was described by jack parker where it becomes easier to implant it so you just kind of stretch it out and leave it there by the time you're done with your channel and all it dehydrates and then it goes in really easily any difficulty in pushing it in post cxl corneas because even in no, no, not at all that segment you know Nothing. you have to push a little harder there really isn't anything like that we actually use little uh, we don't use very tight channels so again it's not like intacts where you have to put tight channels to get better effect 
it doesn't work like that you you can put reasonably big channels the channel size that i use generally is about 1.3 1.31 1.32 uh, the width of the channel and that there the segments go in really well and it gives you a nice uniform smooth effect you know it kind of blunts out the effect and takes it in a very regular uniform way throughout so that there's not much irregularity of the surface and what's the location actually how many millimeters at what millimeter point that you make the shadow optic zone yeah optic zone uh, generally we keep it around 4 point little bit there will be variation from case to case but uh, it will be around 4 point the once case i showed you was even up to 4 that's the only single case i did and that's because uh, uh, carlos abad from uh, you know um, florida had told me you know you should do that uh, and for some of the really advanced cases and i found that the sphere really came down beautifully you know uh, from minus 10 to i think minus 2 or minus 3 it came down uh but uh generally I keep around 4.5 4.6 and then the outer depth the outer diameter would be depending uh, you know just to get that adequate tunnel width and no suture no suture no suture um unless you know there's been a rough insertion and you know for example we had some trainees who had come so if there's been a rough insertion slight uh, you know you feel that there's a gaping of the edge then you can put a suture and remove it off it doesn't matter but i don't like sutures per se as uh, you do in intax again intax you put sutures and you're supposed to get a little more better effect that is not the case you don't really need sutures uh, any recommendation about uh, storage and uh, uh, see you can harvest at one time when you have got corneas but you don't have any patience and you can store it for a longer time so any anything on that any any i think from a routine the one the same things uh, the same things actually uh, we are uh, uh, the same the same things as any stored tissue you could have uh, again in us some of the i banks have already started offering it as pre processed pre stored pre whatever you know stained because they also stain it with trypan glue just so that visibility is better when you push it in uh, tissue uh, so that's that's one possibility you can also have it as freeze dried tissue you could have it as irradiated tissue you could have so many different uh, variations which are all possible so You, you you can have it in mk if you're in a real bit of a, you know immediately going to use it you could use it in optisol but again just as an all corneal tissue i would advise you to be careful about your tissue also you don't have to go in for very old tissues you know 7 8 10 days be careful about that also use reasonably good quality tissue need not be optical grade because you're removing the endothelium but the quality does need to be the the uh, the you know it does need to be good quality and also if you are using very old uh, tissue what happens is you will have edematous tissue which will shrink out once it's inside so what you cut with a trifine would be eventually you wouldn't really get that amount of tissue so if you do if you are using sl slightly edematous tissue let it just dehydrate a bit in the air take it out from the medium and just keep it out there for some time then it dehydrates a bit and then only punch it don't punch it when it's still edematous have you seen but again use good quality tissue yeah so have you seen a difference between mk uh, preserved uh, uh tissue and cornisol preserved tissue because mk preserved tissue is always going to be thicker and cornisol preserved tissue is always going to be thinner yeah yeah i know ma'am uh, actually uh, in our eye bank we uh, we have, we don't use mk at all we use only uh, cornisol so we 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 i have done only with that and generally our eye bank uh, the turnover is also small fast so i generally use one or two three days max old tissues and the grain of tissue is also pretty good because we have a good supply of eyes any other uh, comment or question yeah sir yeah so you know a great uh, talk and great initiative in this field uh, i was just uh, observing all the photographs which you had shown and most of these uh, patient where uh, you have put a segment had a you know haze corneal haze which was quite uh, prominent what sir the corneal haze coming on to that it was not that uh, crystal clear cornea so would that haze remain for a long time or it, uh, would it, uh, would this haze go off after some time because segment will also be little haze here the segment would kind of it doesn't become too hazy sir sometimes it becomes slightly hazy but again it does not seem when you look at the patient uh, as such when you see the patient on the slit lamp you may see a slighter haze again it's out of the visual axis so it doesn't bother you at all uh, it is not symptomatic for the patient uh, but the really opaque kind of uh, corneas don't happen opaque kind of segments don't happen you may get a slight graying out of seg with that segment uh, some of them continue to remain clear for long that just varies but you do not get cornea segments that have become completely opaque like a opaque graft or things like that that does not happen at all okay 
but but i i also i mean i think sir i agree with you the the haze is definitely there although susan is saying that it's not there in the visual axis the presence of it can be seen on a yeah all the photos is it in the visual axis ma'am no no in the axis we could not see but wherever you had put the segment you can actually see yeah. the segment no you can see that but that's what i'm saying it doesn't matter because it's outside the visual axis so haze haze over there is not going to bother you it's like doing a dalk you have a clear cut uh, you know a scar at the, in the periphery that doesn't bother the patient's vision so as long as it's out of the visual axis that haze is not going to cause any uh, any effect on his vision or on progression or anything i progression would not be because of the haze it might be because of other factors uh, any how long do you use topical steroid have... right? sorry sir uh, yeah. any orientation you have about the epithelium site or endothelium site and then you insert it that's, that's, that's actually a very really really good question on. that's that's a really nice question uh, yeah the epithelium site the epithelial site i generally like to prefer i prefer to keep it towards the inner side towards the visual axis and the endothelial side outside and it's actually beautiful when you cut these segments and you flatten it out you can easily make out which is the epithelial side and the endothelial side actually the anatomy of the cornea is so visible right there because the epithelial side is firmer and uh, it it it's uh, it doesn't flatten out as much it remains a little thicker and so to get a greater effect i put it to the visual axis side and the endothelial side because we know the collagen structure is completely different and it's you know different kind of that i put to the side to the edges uh, I think someone asked about steroids. Oh, topical uh, steroid, yes, uh, yes. How long do you use it? Uh, so I use it for about a month and a half uh, in the same dose that I give for cataract. Generally, I give for cataract about six times a uh, a day uh, for one month, and then four times a day for two week, uh, two weeks total of six weeks. That's what I do here also. I I don't know. Maybe you can vary it a bit. You don't have to increase it definitely. Maybe you could decrease it out a bit. But this is what we're doing right now. So the cares that you take, the donor cornea thickness would be different. Sorry, ma'am. Have you the donor cornea thickness for the cares that you take would be different because each of the donor would have different thickness. Different, different patients, different donors would have different thickness. Yeah, different yeah. donors will have different thickness. So what I was just thinking, have you have you considered doing not a not taking complete thickness, but you know taking a split kind of a yeah. Thin, uh, I've done that, ma'am. I've done that where I've made a, a laser a lamellar cut with a femtosecond laser first, and then uh, you know cut cut the cut the segments. actually one of the cases i showed also where that was a patient where one eye was crosslinked and cares was done and the other eye was only crosslinked so the one where the crosslinking and clear cares was done was a lamellar uh, cut because it was very uh, mild cares keratoconus so you can do that and in fact uh, the, uh, the people who are doing with the femtosecond laser they are doing that also uh, where they uh, use uh, lamellar cuts and do it and, and even me when i was uh, doing with the, when i'm doing the refine some some cases i you see i strip cut the strip into further two longitudinal sections which again gives you a thinner segment so you can do all that kind of variation um whatever it is you're not going to get uh, a lot of it will depend on the uh, hydration status of the cornea also so it's not like plastic where 350 means exactly 350 there's going to be a slight variation when you do with the uh, uh, allogenic tissue because it depends on hydration compactness of the tissue and lot of things but what we have seen practically is it doesn't have too much effect because you're not this is not like lasik where you're aiming to do a 6 by 6 for the patient i don't tell any of the patients look i'm going to get you 6, 6 by 6 i tell them that your visual quality is going to improve your refractive error is uh, going to decrease you will become more comfortable your visual aberrations will improve but you're not going to have to wear glasses you have to be uh, you know uh, uh, you have to accept that now there are people as i said in australia um, as as well as in toronto uh, in uk uh, canada where they are also planning to do topo guided uh, cares first followed by topo guided prk maybe if you do that you know they'll get a, a better uh, you know and more or less spectacle dependence but uh, i for one i'm little conservative about doing reduction techniques on a keratoconus patient i somehow feel scared about doing that always so i don't do it but people who do it would uh, definitely get a better improvement still So also one thing is a lot of regular astigmatism can be reduced to regular astigmatism so if you have done that you could do a fakey kayol after that yeah okay so but as you said we can do fakey kayol after that so let's start the fakey kayol and uh, we move on to the next talk and uh, we have dr himanshu matalia who will be talking about uh, fakey implants thank you and that was such a wonderful talk i i thought just let's stop there only <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep discussing cares, huh? <laughs> very true, very true. Uh, is my slide? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. So I do not have any uh, financial disclosure here. Uh, uh, 
fake cars have come as a boon to refractive surgery and especially because uh, it is such a less expensive procedure that uh, the setup does not require much all we need is digital caliper and if you are uh, using some forceps maybe, maybe we can just buy forceps and manipulate and that's it that's the only uh, investment we need uh, for uh, for the refractive surgery and that has changed a lot and that has made it widely acceptable by mass what it uh, does it it brings in uh, responsibility in our hand to make sure that we select the patients properly so that we don't end up uh, having results which are uh, not so great and that's where we start sharing our knowledge with each other and this is one such attempt i'm doing we all are doing uh, the surgery and I, I i really don't think we need to teach anybody this thing but there are some small snippets and some small points which i thought i'll share with you all uh, so when we talk about uh, fake ecal that we don't need anything, uh, do we actually need something like topography? Well, look at one such case, uh, a case with uh, both eyes compound myopic astigmatism. Left eye division was little less and was planned for fake ecal. When we did a topography, you see that there is significant amount of asymmetry on, on the cornea. And such kind of cornea, which is such asymmetric with almost six diopter difference in hemimeridians, certainly fake ical is not going to help. And it's certainly not going to give you a good uh, visual outcome. So yes, topographers are mandatory and I prefer Pentacam uh, in uh, my practice. So when we talk about uh, the parameters which we need uh, to you know, study or which we need to uh, decide about uh, the fake ecal, there are two parameters which stand out, which is one AC depth and second is horizontal white to white. When we talk about interior chamber depth, it can be measured by many devices from contact devices like uh, our uh, uh, a scan probe where we have to uh, reduce the pachymetry from that but more commonly used devices are optical devices like uh, say IL master topographers asoct the cutoff value typically uh, accepted is more than uh, uh, three millimeter which is uh, basically uh, looking at the safety uh, of the fake ecal across. Now, when we talk about fake ecal, I have a disclaimer that I use uh, uh, two of them. One is ICL and IPCL. I do not have experience with uh, other you know, fake ecal, which I'm sure uh, Rajesh will be able to help us out uh, here. Uh, but so when we talk about uh, any of these fake ecal, we prefer that the anterior chamber depth is a little bit on the higher side. However, when the anterior chamber depth we are looking at, it's not just the number which we are looking at. We should also look at the pattern of uh, iris topography, whether it's flat, whether it's convex, whether it's uh, concave. And also when using uh, ASOCT, we can measure something called crystalline lens rise. Now, this is the amount of lens which is projecting in front of the pupillary plane. And more the crystalline lens rise, less will be your vault. So be aware that sometimes the lenses which are uh, more uh, spherical, more, which are projecting a little more in the anterior chamber can give you a false uh, idea about uh, the entire outcome. Uh, also looking at cases like keratoconus where the center anterior chamber depth can be quite decent, but which does not give you a true idea about what exactly the peripheral depth would be. So in cases of keratoconus, be aware by taking that three millimeter as a sacrosanct figure where we may end up uh, in issues. Coming to the next measurement, which is white to white measurement. We all know that white to white, horizontal white to white cornea uh, uh, can have variability. Uh, well, using different instrument, but by uh, by default, uh, what's suggested is uh, measuring with a digital caliper under uh, uh, under surgical microscope in diffuse light. Now, very typically, many of us uh, do not always follow that, and we simulate such kind of condition on slit lamp by putting a diffuser and reducing the illumination, reducing uh, uh, the magnification. But having said that. There are different ways of measuring white to white, and there are more intuitive ways like uh, the optical devices like Pentacam, IL Master, Keratog. Many of these topographers can give you a number, but this is a uh, measurement of my own right eye. And if you can see from this thing, 
each instrument has given different values and there's nothing which can be right and wrong here we know that by themselves they can have repeatability good repeatability but they cannot be interchanged with each other so hence uh, what i prefer is we should have double uh, validation process or the second uh, process which validates the measurement so the primary process is uh, one of these things which i take as a baseline and then i go ahead and confirm with my digital caliper uh, please remember in cases like keratoconus where you know, there are allergic eye disease and there can be pigmentation at the limbus many of such kind of measurement can be fallacious so just be aware when you see the patient on slit limb the way i do is i go on pentacam and i do an image inversion uh, which gives me more contrast i measure with my digital caliper and i feed that value on my digital vernier caliper and then i confirm it on slit limb what it helps here is that uh, by 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 default i have a baseline to uh, play with and now uh, when i go on the eye i can adjust uh, and do the fine adjustment uh, there in which works uh, on my hand now whatever we do the measurement what we are taking is from cornea the lens which we are putting is in sulcus and though uh, we we believe that uh, there is an agreement between white to white and the sulcus but which is not true so measurement of sulcus uh, can be performed using certain ultrasound biomicroscopy devices and which can actually give you uh, a nice idea about uh, the entire uh, area whether you want horizontal vertical whichever you want in fact some of them uh, like quantel machine can give you simulation also for icl that uh, uh, that can potentially help you to decide about uh, the sizing now when we talk about this thing we assume that there is a nice uh, uh, correlation between your white to white and sulcus to sulcus because we are measuring white to white only mind you no company tells you to measure sulcus and uh, send across uh, the measurement because if they do like this thing you are significantly reduce uh, going to reduce the market size because not everybody would have availability of ubm and that to certain you know, particular type of ubm so yes still the gold standard is white to white but when we assume that the correlation between white to white and sulcus to sulcus by default what we see is that horizontal white to white is almost 0.5 mm smaller than the sulcus to sulcus horizontally which is not true because we have now enough studies which show that the correlation is such moderate and poor that uh, it's very difficult to actually surrogate uh, one from each other so does it mean that uh, we should throw away white to white and just embrace uh, sulcus to sulcus but interestingly the repeatability on ubm on sulcus to sulcus measurement also is not as great as we think so uh, measuring sulcus to sulcus on ubm and then uh, ordering the lens uh, you still can end up uh, having uh, size mismatch so uh, is there a role of ubm yes the ubm still can have a role in cases where you, know, you have uh, uh, abnormal vault uh, or irregular vault or uh, sometime where you are not sure about uh, how the foot plate is there a ubm can show you the kinking of the haptic it can show you ciliary body cyst it can help you to measure you know, sulcus in different direction and can possibly help you to possibly rotate the lens and without just explanting uh, the lens uh, having said that ubm uh, is certainly a luxury it's not a mandatory instrument for this so once we decide about the lens then comes the surgery day and there we have to mark uh, the excess uh, for that uh, toric ipcl or icl now uh, typically when we measure uh, when we uh, mark the axis we like to mark the horizontal 0 180 degree axis there are many ways and many techniques what what i prefer is i prefer you know, using slit lamp and using uh, a 26 gauge needle to do a scratch incision horizontal undilated condition and using swinking slit lamp technique where uh, you put uh, a slit horizontal slit uh, on one pupil then swing uh, uh, the uh, slit lamp on the other side and if uh, it passes through the same uh, uh, position in the other eye in the center of the pupil we know there is no head tilt 
But if we find that when you turn it and it goes on the other side, which is not in the same place, well, uh, sorry for the cartoon, which has moved a little bit. But uh, when we know that it, it's moved, that, that means there is a head tilt and you actually need to correct it. So similarly, if uh, we find out, uh, you can see from this video here, uh, so this side, there is a head tilt uh, towards the left and I, I put uh, the head more towards the right side. And when I swing it back, I know now there is no head tilt uh, here. And this helps me to reduce my head tilt related skewing, which can occur while marking the 0, 180 degree. Once we mark uh, the 0, 180 degree, then interoperatively it becomes much easier because uh, that's the baseline. Whether you're dealing with uh, IPCL, which is smart toric, where you don't need to worry about any other axis, or you are dealing with the uh, ICL, where you can still have a baseline of 0, 180 degree. And as you can see from uh, here, I'm uh, parking both the nasal and temporal side. One uh, area which you should be aware that when you, when you cross the... Like if you're using your left end and marking the right eye, and when you cross the eyeball and go towards the nasal side, that's where no, the edge of your needle uh, actually marks and not the tip. So it's the bevel which marks. So you need to adjust your needle in a way that bevel still remains horizontal and you end up getting a horizontal impression and no, not an oblique impression there. Uh, with now um, better devices uh, or the guided systems like Callisto and others, we can actually confirm whether the marking is uh, proper or not. And as you can see here, uh, I'm marking here and with Callisto, when I confirm, I, I found out that my marking was not accurate. And that uh, certainly helps when we have guided system like this thing. Having said that, is it mandatory? Of course not. If you are careful about marking, it still can uh, be a good technique. Then comes loading. Once you mark, then uh, we load the lens. Uh, as we know that the lens should not be loaded too much in advance because once it gets dehydrated, it does not open very fast. And spe especially in case of ICL compared to IPCL, but always load the lens when you are right there for the surgery. Now the loading for ICL is front loading. So you need front loading surface and you are sort of pulling uh, the lens uh, away from the cartridge and uh, hold uh, uh, the forcep in place and pull the cartridge away. As you can see from the video, this is the front loading forcep uh, here. And whenever you close the front loading forcep, it has a tendency to go back inside, it withdraws. So, Wherever you want to hold the lens, hold little larger area than what you target. When you close uh, uh, the lips or uh, the uh, uh, teeth of uh, that forcep, it goes inside. Uh, as you could see that I was injecting the viscoelastic outside to avoid any bubbles which can come out. And then uh, same thing I would do with the saline, inject it out and then uh, dilute with uh, the saline so that uh, it's not very viscous because otherwise the lens can go, get stuck inside. Once we put the lens on the edge and we can just rotate uh, uh, the lens uh, and it just stays inside. The interesting uh, part uh, here is that uh, uh, the lens which we load uh, in case of ICL uh, has convexity up, whereas in IPCL, it's concavity upwards. Now coming to the um, IPCL loading, well, with, this is something very similar to a normal butterfly cartridge uh, kind of thing. And it's very simple. You place the lens in the cartridge and uh, close the cartridge and put the lens inside and pretty simple thing. Uh, mind you, the IPCL has multiple holes uh, and there are those optic holes which must be up uh, there. So if you are not properly aligning your lens uh, while uh, uh, loading, you may end up having an upside uh, down lens in which you may have to rotate. Uh, for that, what I uh, follow is I follow the uh, acronym of uh, RHTDM, that one old movie when we were young uh, uh, had come. and. Uh, this RHTDM stands for right eye hold towards me. So when I'm loading uh, an IPCL uh, on the cartridge for the right eye, the holes are towards me. So RHTDM, right eye hold towards me. And when it's left eye, holes are away from me. And when we load uh, uh, these kind of lenses, uh, when you inject inside, well, it you know, invariably goes uh, properly. Uh, the loading the lens, uh, uh, 
again uh, for a while now i have been loading uh, both icl as well as ipcl under saline only uh, again i must uh, give a disclaimer there is nothing right and wrong in hydro uh, insertion and hydro loading whatever works in your hand you can uh, go ahead the advantage of hydro loading uh, is uh, that uh, uh, it's less sticky and it uh, actually uh, comes the lens comes uh, inside uh, quite easily and you don't need to wash it uh, too much because there's no visco out uh, uh, there uh, as i was uh, telling you once you load the lens for icl the convexity is up whereas when you load the lens in ipcl the concavity is up and once it goes inside it opens accordingly then comes the implantation once the lens is loaded uh, we implant the uh, lens well for uh, ipcl which is customized uh, toric rather it's personalized lens for each adapter of astigmatism cylinder power size uh, so when we go inside the eye well we just don't need to mark the steep axis or anything like that or lens axis we just have to mark horizontal 0 180 degree you know if you have uh, imaging system, uh, you don't need to do that also. Uh, so the rotation chart and those things which are required for uh, an toric ICL may not be required for uh, IPCL. So what we uh, do, well, this is the hydro insertion uh, of an IPCL. So mark 0, 180 degree, uh, put uh, two uh, side port incision and on the left side where I put my irrigating cannula, I put it a little larger. And then I uh, use intraocular lignocaine and uh, form the uh, chamber and then enter the eye with 2.8 keratome. Uh, then uh, I put irrigating cannula there and uh, remember to reduce the bottle height by almost 50 to 55 uh, uh, centimeters so that uh, there is no increase hydrostatic pressure in the eye. Otherwise, you will end up getting uh, pupil, uh, I mean, iris prolapse and those things. Once uh, we Put the lens inside then all no, it's required is just to tuck the haptic uh, under the iris uh, after tucking the haptic uh, whether it's icl or ipcl i would always rotate the lens in two direction clockwise and anti-clockwise direction which you'll be able to see here now this is an icl uh, under visco so again no, two side ports uh, i didn't have a 2.8 uh, millimeter uh, I mean, I, three millimeter uh, keratome. So uh, I, I put uh, three millimeter uh, staining there so that I can enlarge my wound accordingly. Uh, after injecting the adequate amount of visco uh, inside, uh, once we uh, open the uh, main wound, and then you know, all it's needed is to inject uh, the ICL slowly inside. The ICL opening is a little slower uh, than uh, the IPCL opening. So be uh, careful and uh, um, uh, wait uh, and, and do the surgery a little slowly there. After putting the lens, uh, I usually put visco on top of it to flatten the lens and remove the excess visco which was there around. And then uh, tuck uh, the haptics under the eye. While tucking the haptics, uh, you can see that I'm I'm sort of running on the haptic and not pulling it one go and uh, tucking it uh, slowly. And while rotating uh, the lens, uh, while tucking helps you to tuck it easily. As I was telling you, I go clockwise and anti-clockwise. This maneuver helps me to unfold the foot plates if at all uh, they have been folded and uh, which uh, certainly is a good habit and there's no harm in that. The visco wash after especially using the newer models with the central hole has to be thorough because earlier at least we had a large PI. Now uh, the hole size is almost 360 micron, which is very small, maybe enough for, uh, for the aqueous, but certainly not enough for the visco elastic, which is behind uh, uh, the lens. So make sure the wash is thorough and then only uh, stop the case. Once the surgery is done, the outcome is dependent on the, how the lens is uh, placed or the vaulting of the lens. By vaulting, what we know is that uh, uh, it's distance between the back surface of the lens and the front surface uh, of the natural crystalline lens. 
any vault which is uh, which is sort of 250 micron to almost i would say 800 900 micron is good enough it also depends upon your nt chamber depth and also depends upon the topography of your iris if you have uh, iris which is concave uh, there can be more chances uh, of pigment dispersion if the vault is a little higher on the site. Uh, similarly, uh, you, you should take uh, care based on your interior chamber depth available in the periphery. So when we talk about uh, vault, vault measurement uh, can be done using Pentachem if you do not have ASOCT, but preferred method would be an ASOCT, which can show you very accurately the vault. Now, if the vault is high, what happens is there are chances of pigment dispersion, angle closure glaucoma or pigment dispersion glaucoma. Uh, pupil may be irregular, may not be reacting to light uh, and uh, may require uh, either replacement or explantation of the lens. If the vault is too low, there can be lenticular touch and there can be early cataract formation as well as the rotational instability of toric lenses. Now, when is a uh, vault reliable? Now, if it is hydro insertion, the vault can be reliable quite immediately. On the same day, I would rather uh, do an uh, OCT and know about my vault. But if it is visco insertion, it depends upon if uh, the visco is still part of the small amount of visco is still remaining in front of the lens, then uh, it will show you falsely low vault. If it is a little bit behind, it may show you falsely high vault. The total uh, drainage of the visco may take three to four days uh, time. So in case of irregular vault uh, or rather uh, high or low vault, you might want to wait for a uh, few days to make sure uh, whatever you are measuring is the true measurement. So uh, whether it's uh, the visco or hydro insertion, whatever works in your hand, you surely can uh, use. Initial cases, visco insertion would be a better uh, choice. Uh, there are certain tricks of uh, sizing of the fake ecal which I follow. Uh, before we go into uh, this thing, let's uh, assume that uh, we understand that a same size lens, when we put in a larger diameter eye, the vault will be low. And the same size when it's placed in a smaller diameter eye, the vault would be higher. It's very small, I mean, very normal and intuitive, right? So let's now take an example. Now, with the three millimeter, uh, the caveat here, here is the NTHM depth, we are talking about almost three millimeter here. Now, if we have the horizontal white to white, uh, which is 11.7, .7, the calculator is going to tell you to put 13.2 millimeter uh, size ICL. At the same time, even if we have 12.3 millimeter uh, white to white, the calculator is still going to tell you to put 13.2 millimeter lens. So where do you think uh, vault will be higher? Well, we spoke about that smaller eye larger lens vault is going to be high so the first case the vault is going to be high hence uh, we know that while uh, taking the measurement if we are on the lower side of that range for that particular size the chances are that the vault can be high so which is the bad combination well our white to white is on the lower range and the entire chamber depth is on the lower side and which is not the best combination now let's take advantage. Uh, take, take an example of toric IPCL. Now IPCL is available in more number of sizes. Uh, again, no, one of that eleven point six five. The machine is going to tell you to take uh, thirteen millimeter, and eleven point nine three. It's still going to tell you to take thirteen millimeter. Where do you think vault is going to be low? I'm talking about low vault. Well, we spoke about it. A larger eye. Putting a smaller lens, the vault can be low. So in such kind of cases, when uh, we are on the higher side of the range of your white to white for that particular size measurement, there are chances that vault can be a little low. And when the vault is low, the rotational stability also can suffer. So remember, if I have to take uh, a, a, a lens with uh, say uh, uh, 13 millimeter for this kind of measurement, I might actually go ahead and take little larger size or next size like 13.25 and which is going to increase uh, my vaulting by 60 percent of whatever so uh, with 250 micron well I'm, I'm possibly expecting uh, increasing vault by 150 micron which is not that bad but what it's going to do is it's going to give me a rotational stability in case of toric lens
right? Finally, the last part is about fecal and keratoconus. Now, keratoconus not always fecal works. One my such case, I uh, did a uh, fecal non-corrected vision was six nine. I was super happy, but patient was not happy because patient had uniocular diplopia because of decentered cone. Now, when cone is decentered, we can with the fecal we can treat lower order aberration sphere and cylinder. But what uh, Susan was talking about, uh, uh, where the higher order abrasions like coma is there, it's still going to be glaringly open there and it's going to not be of help. So reserve such kind of thing for central cone. Uh, when we talk about uh, fake ECL, well, we have to take the measurement uh, of subjective acceptance. And in keratoconus, we know there is a significant variability in test retest variability in subjective acceptance. So whether the measurement which we are taking is correct or not, that itself is questionable. So one such case I had, uh, she got pregnant and I uh, offered her that after her pregnant delivery, I'll do a fake KL. And when uh, the time came, when I measured it, this was uh, the acceptance or, or this was the topographic axis, steep axis. And this axis was the steep axis for acceptance. And by no means I could give her anything better than the excess which she is accepting on that subject acceptance. So there's a huge amount of uh, difference there. And with such high cylinder, I may end up uh, under delivering then and actually helping out patient. Hence, I decided not to go for it. But another case where uh, both uh, the subjective and objective uh, axis were matching and central cone, well, you surely can give a significantly great visual outcome Though optically, you still can have those common which can be there, but patient can overall be quite happy in such cases. In case of uh, a cone which is decentered, you can do intex first and then uh, you can uh, do a fake KL, and which can possibly give you a little better outcome compared to doing a fake KL in a decentered cone or a cone which is not regular, it may not be the smartest idea. The, the surgery is not very uh, difficult, but sometimes the ring can uh, give you a parallax. So move the eyeball a little bit here and there, and which can help you to uh, see the lens clearly. So in fake KL, keratoconus, it's best for central cone. Uh, it can treat the high spherical equivalent, but uh, please be aware uh, that sometimes topo and reflection may not match. The central anterior chamber depth can be sometimes deceptive. So please uh, remember that peripheral depth or looking at the uh, topography of your iris is equally important. The white to white sometimes can be fallacious on optical devices with uh, pigmentation in cases of VKCs. And when you're doing such kind of procedure, I would rather do a cross-linking first, wait for stability of the ocular uh, surface or corneal surface, and then plan such uh, cases. Uh, finally, uh, before I close, I'll tell you the instrument which I would possibly invest in. One mandatory part is digital caliper, which is absolutely mandatory for white to white. The Penta can, can help uh, for the optical white to white, can help us to measure the AC depth, can help us to measure the vault at least roughly, and can be a quite good uh, instrument, uh, can be uh, used, and I certainly endorse that. Uh, UBM is optional, can help you in irregular cases or cases where you're not sure about your white to white, can help you in cases where uh, you are uh, end up having a uh, size mismatch and can help you to diagnose ciliary body cyst and uh, those things. Uh, uh, anterior chamber OCT can be very good, uh, especially to measure the uh, vault uh, and can help you to measure the anterior chamber angle or crestline lens rise, but it's optional. These things, if you have, you certainly can use it. Uh, with this, I Thank you, Himanshu, for a very nice uh, overview on fake implants. Uh, we would like to have comments from Dr. Anjum. Uh, yeah. the, I exactly agree with him that the most important thing is manner by digital caliper because otherwise the much variation occurs between different instruments. So actually, when you are measuring by digital caliper, you can decide your science, lens size in better way. And uh, beside other measurement, one measurement also we take that uh, pupillary size in mesopic condition. 
so we determine the we customize the size of optic size by ordering the particular size in most of cases we put 6 or 6.2 kind of optical optic size because now the most company has increased the optic size of lens so if we exactly determine the optical size then we can do the less crowding of lens inside the anterior chamber and less rise of iop in most of cases okay thank you uh, dr anjum and uh, yes as you said the digital caliper definitely is the gold standard and we also use digital calipers we did a study comparing various uh, instruments and we found out that the obviously we took digital caliper as the standard but uh, uh, the difference of wide to wide be between digital caliper and uh, iol master which is very often used uh, you know very often kept by the cataract and refractive surgeons was uh, 0.364 i could figure out that your uh, white to white was 11.8 and with the iol master uh, it was uh, 12.1 so it was also close to that only so that was one thing and uh, as ubm also we found out that in ubm we had a little variability because there is a subjectivity when you measure it depends on the iris insertion as well that where you have to put your cursor to actually measure the circus diameter and as uh, sulcus diameter is definitely 0.42 mm more than the white to white but it varies in different axes it is not always 0.42 in all the axes so it is variable and that is the reason that is also one of the reasons apart from the the sizes that you said the minimum and the maximum for the icl size these are the factors for variability of the size of the fake implant i think uh, that's the correlation is so poor that uh, we are yeah. sort of forcibly putting that uh, relation that uh, 0.4 0.5 larger yeah. uh, horizontally but uh, everybody who has studied uh, yeah. has found that you know what there is such poor correlation sometimes this is different but unfortunately uh, no industry is going to uh, tell us to measure sts and uh, do the fakey cards now we did that study comparing is using sts also but in sts also there is a variability so we found out Very that true. the sts we could uh, figure out the correct measurement of uh, icl in 87% of cases by with digital cap caliper it was 80% and there was some uh, it was basically correlated with the vault and uh, we kept 250 to 750 as the accurate vault so there was uh, this uh, margin of error in uh, sts also because there is some subjectivity in that as well the best part is uh, the lenses are available in finite size and the anterior yeah. chamber is deep enough so yeah. everything is sort of taken care by little increase vault yeah. and decrease vault and we are we are happy and patients are happy so in spite of not having a very accurate method of measurement um, we still on. are able to deliver um, it yes so sure. sure. think uh, dr tetyal sir has done a very good study on the intra op uh, measuring of the vault sir if i remember so would you think that intra opacity has made a difference to the way you do uh, icls <laughs> i think that in terms of a uh, i think let me comment on the white to white measurement first i think we all know uh, the caliper is a gold standard instrument to one of them and second would be any other device which you are comfortable with unfortunately we don't have uh, the slit scanning system now available with us otherwise that was the one of the most important uh, optical device which could have given a quite a reliable reading of white to white now uh, we are uh, either taking a iol master or a pentacam as a secondary instrument and those should correlate well for a, being a comfortable uh, part on the white to white measurement otherwise as you discuss uh, sulcus to sulcus or uh, if you look into a, a japanese group they now working on a you know, angle to angle distance and that for them uh, seems to be a very accurate way to uh, use the you know sizing for their uh, icls as far as intra op uh, measurements are concerned i think that was one of the first study by us to uh, to really know what is the vault in the you know during your surgery itself rather than looking next day and what was your uh, this thing and ocd uh, we could measure them the accurately also but it, it has not changed the your surgery at all because remain say you are only confident that your uh, 
ICL in a proper or IPCL in a proper vault on the table. And uh, fortunately, this uh, final measurement on the table also matched the next day uh, post op measurements also. So that is just a safeguard. Uh, till date, in a thousands of eyes, we have not had a single case where we had to explain based on an intraoperative vault, which may be a very rare thing because, as uh, Himansu rightly, rightly told us, the, whatever measurements we are doing, they are giving us a reasonably good uh, vault, which may be within a 250 to you know, 800, 900 volts. M most of the cases, despite having a little variation in our measurements also. That's a good part. Uh, the only thing which helped I, uh, IOCT on the table was, especially with the beginners, where they could not realize, especially IPCL, that open reverse. And that could be picked up very effectively with the uh, OCT on the table. That was a great help for our beginners because sometimes they don't realize the, as you said, you know, right towards me and left uh, towards you, that uh, they couldn't understand. And sometimes the lens flips inside also, especially the smaller or pupil size. So that was a great help. I was really helped in the only one way. And the analysis which we have done, we also looked into uh, what actually dynamics of uh, ICL with the uh, anterior lens capsule, the space during your uh, implantation, during your haptic uh, insertion and uh, viscoelastic removal. So we could measure the, the vault from the anterior lens capsule in these cases. And if you do a careful aspiration, it never touches the lens capsule. So that was uh, very safeguarding to us. That means the surgical insert may not be the cause for a cataract formation in the most cases. It is uh, some other cause which causes cataract in these cases, that is mainly a vault or a viscoelastic related inflammation. That was the only help IOCT gave us uh, knowing the exact uh, the shape and placement of lens. Okay. Thank you, sir. So we move on to the next talk now, and that is IOL considerations in glaucoma patients by Dr. Aru Chakravarti. Good evening, friends. Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah, we can. We can. Yes, yeah. yes. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Iskaras, uh, Professor Titiyal, Dr. Rajesh, Dr. Namrata, for uh, asking me to participate in this uh, very interesting uh, program. And I will be talking on IOL considerations in glaucoma patients. Uh, this title appears to be an odd man out. When you heard uh, Susan talking about her innovation, and then such a practical talk on fakic IELTS by uh, Himanshu. Uh, but if we uh, view the broader perspective, you know, this is the era of uh, refractive cataract surgery. And uh, we have a lot of newer lenses uh, exploding into the market. And uh, uh, so uh, they have been quite well received. So we just want to know how they apply uh, when we think about our glaucoma patients. Can the same concepts be you know, utilized when we do cataract surgery in our glaucoma patients. Since uh, I will be uh, talking about few intraocular lenses, uh, I would like to say that I have no financial interest in the topics of my presentation. Well, you know, the, the intraocular lenses have evolved over the years and there has been a virtual revolution in the last couple of years in terms of the biomaterial selection in, unless, in our understanding or awareness of glistenings and uh, you know, uh, the, there's a question about hydrophilic or hydrophobic um, biomaterial. Uh, recently, there was an article, the American Journal, you know, which uh, sort of debunked the idea of using hydrophilic lenses uh, in, uh, in some of the situations. And then uh, toric lenses have become the standard of care for cataract surgery for most of us today. And then the presbyopia correcting intraocular lens, the PC intraocular lenses. You know, there has been uh, a tremendous, uh, the, I mean, there's a plethora of such lenses that have come to the market and we have got enhanced access to these uh, newer lenses. Now, these uh, PC eyewells uh, basically uh, have a greater range of vision and enhanced uh, spectacle independence. All these things, oh. as we know, uh, come with uh, a trade-off, you know, because uh, they are associated with increased incidence of uh, dysphotopsia. They reduce the quality of vision uh, in terms of reduction of uh, by, by reducing contrast sensitivity function of the patient. 
So, uh, <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, the newer lenses that have come up in the last couple of years have sort of, you know, minimized uh, the side effects, uh, these undesirable effects of this presbyopia correcting intraocular lenses. And uh, in spite of that, for our routine surgery, routine patients are healthy eyes, but for cataract, we are still cautious, though the numbers have gone up. Uh, I would like to say that uh, glaucoma patients having cataract surgery want the same thing as other patients. You know, they also want a refractive cataract surgery. Uh, but as I just mentioned, the, the undesirable effects, you know, the reduction of the contrast sensitivity, dysphotopsia, etc., cetera, uh, which uh, can impair, uh, which can further um, exacerbate the already impaired the visual system in the glaucoma patients. So before we embark on surgery, we must remember that first cause no harm, primum non nocere, and then take a decision. So what exactly uh, are the factors, you know, that have to be taken into account in glaucoma patients? You know, with the glaucoma patients are periodic, routinely followed up. We do the field of vision charting. We do the OCT uh, periodically every six months or every one year. It is important to note that the multifocal lenses reduce the mean deviation on standard automated perimetry, including size three and size five. And in terms of during OCT imaging, also there are wavy artifacts. So these multifocal lenses can definitely impact uh, the follow-up of a glaucoma patient. Uh, if you look at the literature, uh, the late Roger Steinert and his team had uh, presented way back in 2014 where they had compared uh, the multifocal lenses uh, with the monofocal lenses in terms of reduction in mean division values. And it was clearly demonstrated that there was a significant depression in the mean division to the tune of two decibels in the multifocal group. These are only normal patients, normal healthy eyes, otherwise healthy eyes. So uh, the group concluded that multifocal lens may, may, be, may not be advisable in patients with glaucoma, and with patients with other comorbidities like macular degeneration and RP changes, et cetera. And uh, this was actually in the context of C10-2. And uh, the year before, JAMA had published a similar article uh, with uh, uh, C30-2 being used uh, in, the, in the study. So uh, next, we come on to the contrast sensitivity. We all know that you know, glaucoma patients have impaired contrast sensitivity. And multifocal lenses have do exactly the same thing. They impaired, further impaired the contrast sensitivity. So that is going to be the focus of my talk uh, when I talk about IR selection. So I'll be talking about it a little while from now. Small pupils are more likely to be encountered in glaucoma patients. And all those uh, pupil-dependent technologies, for example, the refractive uh, multifocal intraocular lenses, which of course are not uh, used much, you know, they require a pupil size of minimum 3.5 millimeters. So those lenses may not do well. And uh, pseudo-exfoliation glaucoma form, uh, forms an important chunk in a glaucoma patients, in a cataract patients, ca patients with cataract and glaucoma. And we all know that there are uh, chances for increased intraoperative complications because of weak zonules, small pupil, and postoperative IL decentration, dislocation, et cetera. So I think in, a, in small pupil situation, a pseudo-exfoliation situation, it may not be a very good idea to use any of these uh, multifocal lenses or even toric intraocular lenses. Now, coming back to the topic of uh, reduced contrast sensitivity in patients with glaucoma, uh, it has been seen that uh, reduction of contrast sensitivity is directly related to the stage of glaucoma. So now here, if you see uh, on the left side, the pillar option chart, patient uh, with uh, the, the group with the advanced glaucoma, the yellow ring that you see here, yellow line here, the contrast sensitivity is significantly increased, compared is, is reduced compared to the blue ring you know, where uh, the contrast sensitivity is within normal limits. These are the normal patients. So we need to avoid any intervention that may further reduce contrast sensitivity. And we just discussed that multifocal lenses do just that. You know, they reduce the contrast. And before the current generation uh, trifocal lenses and other lenses become available, you know, there is to be uh, patients complaining about difficulty reading under low light conditions with certain, certain models. So what do we do? Uh, what is the current scenario? There's not much in the published literature because with the knowledge that is available, the awareness that we have today about uh, the contrast sensitivity impact of multifocal lenses and the, 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 you know, the situation in glaucoma. So there'll be no large scale uh, you know, prospective trials to help us in this direction. So most of the time, our, uh, our own experiences teach us and there are few reports in the literature or retrospective studies. Actually, when I reviewed my own case series, I found out that last year, I had six patients, uh, long-term patients who have uh, been operating for the last 10, 15 years. 
they came for follow up and one of these patients uh, had uh, she was 62 when she was operated upon and she still continues to have a vision of 6 uncorrected vision of 66 six and n6 right eye had the panoptic left eye had the panoptic story she was found to have a significant field changes as well as rnfl thickness changes in the left eye so she, we, uh, she had no other symptoms she was perfectly happy otherwise so i just put her on anti glaucoma medication just a beta blocker and uh, she is doing pretty well now when i reviewed the literature just 6 months back this particular article you know it looked into uh, uh, the same issue the visual function and patient satisfaction in multifocal patients with comorbidity and they took into account glaucoma as well as age related macular degeneration the results actually are quite uh, expected you know so the non disease die and even the preperimetric glaucoma eyes you know they tend to tended to behave almost uh, on uh, similar uh, lines you know, so they had a better uh, uh, mon monocular distance corrected or uncorrected vision than the glaucomatous eyes or the eyes with the rnd that's easy to understand and then the glaucoma patients with multifocal lenses had a contrast sensitivity which was significantly depressed for 12 uh, the cycles per degree uh, charting and then uh, the normal healthy patients or the preperimetric glaucoma patients had more halos on the other hand the glaucoma patients had more glare and more difficulty driving at night so uh, this was actually pertaining to the lenses of the previous generation and now we have a much better lenses that have exploded in, in the in the scenario so let me review some of the literature uh, we we really don't have much uh, information available on how these new lenses are performing in the glaucoma patients so we know from the fda trials or from other important published literature uh, how they do in routine eyes and the, perhaps the results can be extrapolated now this particular is taken from the, this particular chart is from the fda trial and this compares the panoptic accuracy of panoptics with the with the accuracy of iq uh, both with and uh, in the presence of glare and the absence of glare in mesopic as well as, as photopic conditions and you find out that at all spatial frequencies the panoptics trifocal has performed almost similar to the the, the monofocal counterpart so from this point of view you know there is hardly any alteration in contrast sensitivity with the panoptics intraocular lens now, the other lens which has again come to our market now the vvt lens so here the visual disturbance profile was very similar to the to the monofocal counterpart that is iq lens and uh, the binocular contrast sensitivity is not significantly different from that with the monofocal i will uh, not the monocular but the binocular contrast sensitivity and that's what matters because most of the patients perform binocularly so perhaps vvt may have a greater role in patients with comorbidities Technis uh, Symphony uh, was launched with a lot of fanfare and a lot of people used it and we have used it and let us see how it has done. Uh, in a uh, peer-reviewed literature, in an article published in 2018, uh, Symphony was found to have no difference with the Technis uh, monofocal lens in terms of contrast sensitivity function. An article that was published one year later showed that Symphony lay somewhere between the monofocal and the multifocal group, better than the multifocal group. And uh, the other side effects are that like dysphotopsia and you know, spectacle independence was as good as the trifocal lenses. So perhaps the Technis Symphony may be considered in patients with underlying comorbidities affecting the contrast sensitivity function. And uh, finally, the other lens, you know, the IHANS lens, you know, it, we know it is not, uh, it is not the full uh, range of vision lens. It provides a more limited range of vision, though additional intermittent vision when you compare to the monofocal lens. It's, it has a visual disturbance profile, which is similar to that of in a standard monofocal lens. Same thing about the contrast sensitivity profile. So it appears suitable for all patients with glaucoma. So what do I do in my practice? So I would uh, not hesitate to use a, uh, not, not hesitate to consider a multi a trifocal lens for patients who are just glaucoma suspects, ocular hypertension with earlier mild glaucoma damage that has been controlled and, and stable with very minimal medications. And there's no signs of glaucoma progression. After everything has been explained to the patient, if the patient agrees, then patient is taken up for uh, multifocal lens surgery. On the other hand, I would uh, I would advise the patient against uh, multifocal lens surgery if the patient has an advanced uh, damage, the central visual field defects, there's a high risk for glaucoma progression assessed by various parameters, and the patient is on heavy medication load. Now, if this category of patients ask me, for uh, uh, enhancement of the spectacle independence, I would think in terms of monovision with aspheric eye intraocular lens. 
And as I just mentioned after reviewing the literature, the EDOF lenses, you know, the symphony or the VVT may be okay for patients with moderate glaucoma. And enhanced monofocal eye will can be used uh, for, uh, for uh, 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 glaucoma patients with any disease state. And another, as we talk about the uh, presbyopia correcting intraocular lenses, the tear films cannot be left behind because you know this is the most refract important refractive surface of the eye. And if this is not taken care of, uh, the biometry will be inaccurate. That will result in wrong IL power calculation, and it also mess up. It may also mess up with the torical calculations. And we all know that uh, the disruption of the ocular surface because of the dry eye uh, is magnified with the multifocal intraocular lens. So, uh, in a uh, patient with glaucoma, you know the almost uh, you know uh, the incidence incidence of ocular surface disease is about fifty nine percent, and uh, the, there are coexisting issues, predisposing factors like patients on topical medications, patients with large blades. We know how unstable surface ocular surface they have. Many of them have membrane gland disease and conjunctival inflammation and scarring. So, until unless this is taken care of. Even in the patients where the multifocal lenses are indicated in glaucoma patients, I would not be I would be hesitant in using multifocal technology in these patients. I would use a toric IOL without any inhibition, without any even thoughts in glaucoma patients who have significant astigmatism. I have got wonderful results. So they do extremely well if you have selected the patients properly, if you have done your measurements well, if you have done your markings well, and if you have handled the toric intraocular lens well. So the, there's no doubt about, you know, the, there's no second question about not using a toric eye in glaucoma patients. On the other hand, when we consider uh, a, a, a toric eye in a patient who is going to undergo phacotrabeculectomy, the issues are uh, different, you know, because in the quantum of induced with the rule astigmatism, uh, regardless of whether mitomycin C has been used and uh, the astigmatic decay when it reaches plateau, all these things are unpredictable. So when uh, this, there is so much of fluctuation in the post-operative outcome, it's difficult to view that, you know, it is difficult to logically use a toric IL in this kind of scenario. Uh, in early 2000, I remember when these uh, yellow promo for uh, blue blocking lens came in the market, there's a lot of debate and it was the glaucoma surgeons debated whether it is going to impact, Im impair the visual field uh, by, uh, uh, function, the, the visual field measurements of these patients. So this was a study published in 2014, which showed that uh, these yellow tinted lenses definitely were much better than the, than the situation when these patients had cataract preoperatively, and they have less effect on swab testing than the visually significant cataracts. So this is a non-issue, uh, the color of the intraocular lens. Another thing that bothers us uh, is the glistenings, and glistenings are seen in all kinds of uh, intraocular, all biomaterials, you know, PMM lenses, hydrophilic acrylic, hydrophobic acrylic, depends upon the manufacturing technique. So in the context of glaucoma, this assumes additional significance because, you know, let me quote from this article, uh, Acta of Thermology in 2014, uh, which showed that in the glistening onset and its severity is time dependent. Longer the follow-up, uh, higher is the incidence of glistening and the severity of the glistening. It also depends upon the number of eye drops the patient is on. If the patient is using more number of drops for a longer period of time, the onset of glistening is much earlier. Uh, likewise, you know, the glistenings, uh, uh, there maybe my early glistenings may not have many deleterious effect on the glaucomatous eye, but it has been, this particular study showed that these uh, glistenings alter the visual performances in reducing contrast sensitivity at high spatial resolution, and it estimates the focal defects analyzed by the perimetry. So before you perform a cataract surgery in a glaucoma patient who have who require multiple medications for a long period of time, we must select a biometric which is less prone for developing uh, glistenings. And uh, finally, even if you have selected the right intraocular lens, you need to calculate the power. So we must be familiar with the newer IL formulas. We also should be familiar with the fact that, you know, that the, if trabeclectomy is thrown in the mix of the surgery with the cataract surgery, then maybe myopic shift in certain situations and hyperopic shift in certain situations. So you may have to set the target refraction accordingly before when you, after the biometry process is done. So friends, in conclusion, uh, as surgeons, our job is to improve a patient's quality of life. No glaucoma patient should be ruled out uh, as a premium male candidate because of his glaucoma status. IOL selection should depend on the patient's interest in spectacular independence, <coughs> visual expectations and needs, his risk tolerance to the side effects, uh, to the undesirable effects of the, the presbyopia correcting intraocular lenses. 
and the severity of glaucoma and medication load. So as more and more modern presbyopic, presbyopic carotene lenses evolve and improve, an increasing number of glaucoma patients may benefit from new technology intraocular lenses. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Arup, for an excellent presentation. It was, it is really a very tricky situation whether the patient is undergoing trabeculectomy or not, and all those scenarios, whether he will undergo trabeculectomy later, what all should be put. So it was a really tricky, it's a tricky situation and very nice presentation with some very good studies that you have shown. Would like to have comments from Dr. J.S. Bhal. I think that was very exhaustive, very uh, uh, this thing, informative uh, talk by Dr. Roof as always. I think the first uh, type of lens which you considered was uh, the multifocal IOLs. Yes, multifocal IOLs, they, uh, glaucoma as such, is a disease in which because of apoptosis of retinal ganglion cells, there is decrease in contrast sensitivity. On top of that, if we add multifocal IOLs also, as you rightly quoted in the study by Fareed et al. published in AGO 2014, there is decrease of mean deviation of one to two decibels. So if we have combination of these two with older generation of multifocal IOLs, the, con the, the uh, contrast sensitivity definitely goes down, particularly in mesopic and scotopic condition. Yes, uh, the, the the newer generation of uh, our trifocal IELTS like uh, VVT, panoptics, the scenario may be difficult, but still since glaucoma is a progressive disease and this decrease in contrast sensitivity is bound to happen in the later stages of disease. If we have a disease of moderate glaucoma, it is going to progress uh, ultimately to uh, maybe advanced glaucoma in a lot of percentage of patients. I think multifocal IULs, I would uh, still avoid in the, these uh, glaucomatous patients. Toric IUL, yes, toric IUL, if we are doing sequential surgery, glaucoma surgery first, and maybe three months later, we are taking that patient for phaco emulsification. Yes, then we can think of putting toric IULs, but in phaco trabeculectomy because of variability of surgically induced ast astigmatism, the results may be slightly different. IOL power calculation very nicely touched upon because as we found that there is decrease uh, in axial length of 0 0.1 to 0 0.9 millimeter after trabeculectomy and increase in with the rule astigmatism. And uh, so there are more chances of uh, residual refractive error in the uh, these patients where we have combined surgery. And there are more chances of hyperopic surprise in three subgroup of patients, particularly if the patient has myopia, younger patients, or if preoperative intraocular pressure is high. So there are more, uh, it is said that there are more chances of uh, hyperopic surprise. And in these three subgroup of patients, it is better to keep uh, overcorrection of maybe even one diopter, not 0.5 diopters. Blue bo blocking IOLs, yes. They uh, even if they don't seem to improve the contrast sensitivity, but it has been published that when subjectively patients are asked, there is increase in contrast perception. So blue blocking IULs are definitely my choice for uh, uh, this thing. Uh, these uh, glaucomatous patients, and of the various uh, whether it is acrylic hydrophilic, acrylic hydrophobic, uh, definitely acrylic hydrophobic is the lens of choice, particularly because of decreased PCO. And uh, uh, now whether the aspheric IULs, yes, we all implant aspheric IULs, but then in particularly uh, pseudo-exfoliation patients where there are more chances of decentration, aspheric IULs may not be a very good choice because they say that aspheric IUL has to be centered within 0.3 millimeter and tilt less than seven degrees should occur. So if we have a uh, pseudo exfoliation, uh, this thing with open angle glaucoma, uh, in that subgroup of patients, we have to be very sure whether there are chances of late subluxation, zonulopathy is more severe, aspheric IULs may be avoided. So what I would do is I would implant aspheric, acrylic, hydrophobic, blue blocking, monofocal IULs, and uh, I would be wary of implanting multifocal IULs as of now. And uh, if I have to implant toric IULs, then I would do that in a sequential uh, surgery. Or if I'm uh, doing 
minimal invasive glaucoma surgery along with phaco emulsification. So that's what I have to say. Thank you, Dr. Balla. Uh, uh, so I would say uh, Arup did a wonderful job uh, highlighting, you know, all the important issues which may be related to uh, uh, glaucoma patients. And uh, he titrated every aspect of, uh, you know, the visual rehabilitation, the uh, subsequent glauco glaucoma assessment, which is so important for all these patients. I think every point was so well covered. Uh, wonderful talk, Arup. Uh, Thank you, sir. We learned so many things in this. As far as I'm concerned, uh, the simplest thing uh, has to be done for a person without uh, increasing the uh, problem associated with uh, the vision of a patient. In that way, I think the monofocal lenses, either aspheric or non-spheric, doesn't make a huge difference, but uh, lens which can provide the best contrast should be given to uh, these patients where contrast may be the issue. So I think any monofocal lens which has the best optics would be given to these patients. So that is a very important consideration. And I think one important issue uh, always we think about is cataract surgery, early cataract surgery in glaucoma patients, especially in uh, uh, shallow chamber or angle closer glaucoma. People talk about, even for the open angle glaucoma also, people say, okay, cataract surgery will uh, have an impact on the control of intraocular pressure. That is also an important issue and uh, long-term result has to be assessed to uh, these patients also. If it's really going to be effective enough to have a better control in these patients, uh, maybe the analysis of uh, visual fields and optic uh, nerve head assessment or a nerve fiber layer assessment may be better in a pseudophagic condition than a patient having little bit of cataract. So I think there's a lot of uh, issues and beautifully highlighted and uh, well uh, you know, uh, supported by the literature, which uh, sometimes uh, we think may not be important. People don't uh, reflect to the literature in their talks, but literature is there to support whatever you know people think about. And sometimes we learn from that, okay, we should be doing in these directions. I think uh, glaucoma patients are uh, there, which are, the, I think, one of the most chronic patients we have in the optical field. After dry eye patients, they are going to come. They never leave you. Whatever you do, they keep coming to you for uh, you know, till they are alive. And uh, things can go wrong anytime in their uh, glaucoma control. And visual acuity is one of the most significant part of uh, anybody's life. And glaucoma patients are the ones, they always fear of uh, losing their vision. So I think we need to really give them a good counseling and a best surgical, I think, uh, approach would be from our side and give a best intraocular lens. Sir, uh, just one comment I wanted to make. You know, I mean, I was uh, uh, just uh, sharing notes with one of my colleagues a couple of years back. So he, uh, for his phaco trabeculectomy, he leaves behind air bubble in the anterior chamber. I don't know why, but he has been doing it that way. And he told me he has come across calcification in uh, patients uh, where they have, he has used hydrophilic acrylic lenses. So we all talk about, you know, hydrophilic acrylic should not be used in patients who are likely candidates for DSEG, DMEG, and who are likely candidates for posterior segment surgery, etc. But I think you know, <laughs> this is also an important thing to be to be kept in the mind that if you use air bubble in trabeculectomy and return the air for some time, there's chances of... Uh, Calcification developing uh, is a reality. I don't use yeah. it. I'm just, Arup, just sharing this, this true, story. Absolutely true. This is a well-known factor. The lens can really have, you know, sort of a haze coming on the, on the surface. And we have seen in all, you know, endothelial keratoplasty patients, highest with the hydrophilic lenses. Even with the PMA lenses, you can have some sort of a deposition coming into the surface. At least with the, you know, the modern day hydrophobic lenses. So this interaction is uh, there in these cases and uh, we always uh, talk about this. And in glaucoma, I've seen many you know, uh, patients having a shallow chamber after surgery. Then you keep reforming these chambers with air, gas, uh, viscoelastic. Sometimes you intervene multiple times in these patients. 
So I think choice of IOL is also very important in these patients, which has to be properly placed in the, in the bag. Because once you do a uh, intervention with the patient where the lens is in the sulcus, you have a PCR, you put a lens in the sulcus, the things become very, very complicated. The surgical expertise is also required in a glaucoma patient or a compromised eyes where your surgery has to be as beautifully managed as you talk to the patient regarding the outcomes with IOS. So I think that's a very, very important point. And uh, people, uh, the general public should also understand some cases require a you know, good, uh, you can say, uh, not only the counseling, the good surgic, surgical hand and approach should also be there. I think uh, if I understood correctly, Dr. Root, you presented a study with panoptics, which compared with the uh, uh, with the uh, with the IQ. Uh, IQ. Yeah. 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 It is an FDA study. Yeah. So it said that it doesn't, you know, really make a difference. So if there is a patient who's insisting that he, you know, gets a lens which uh, which is a multifocal or a trifocal, would you, without any financial interest, would you suggest? That a lens like trifocal or 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 lens like pan optics can be implanted in such patients. No, I would not do so. I mean, I I just I know, mentioned highlighted my indications for using uh, you know multifocal in these patients where ocular hypertension, those who have a very mild and stable glaucoma. If they ask for a multifocal, it, which is non-progressive, you know, I mean, you have we following up the patient and then the rate of progression is absolutely. Minimal, and maybe in those cases, perhaps you can do it. In fact, I showed one uh, a case report, case series. One lady in both eyes, and I had operated five or six years back, and she they usually get lost to follow up. They do extremely well. So this lady happened to come back uh, last year. I had six such patients coming back. You know, they went on to develop uh, you know visual field changes and all that because we dilated and so on. None of them were symptomatic. And uh, they are not on treatment. So we just started, I mean, when I did the surgery, they, they are not glaucoma patients, mm. you know, so they are not even glaucoma suspects, but then they come back after six years, 10 years, you know, when they're aged. So that so most of the, most of the cases, I think, in the, even the case reports that you see in the literature, not uh, prospective studies, these are all retrospective studies. So, so far, uh, six patients that I have seen uh, with the multifocal lenses, they have not complained. They have not had very advanced disc changes, very early changes. Enough fibrillar changes, just you know, just beginning, and some early field changes. Maybe you know, so I have to ensure that they do not progress further. But as you correctly said, you know, if it is a known patient of glaucoma and with so much of you know dogma against uh, you know, using a, a multifocal lens in glaucoma, I would not use it. No. Particularly who is advanced and who may go to trabeculectomy. Yeah, yeah, no way. It was an excellent talk with the best yeah. part was that it was evidence-based and absolutely evidence-based otherwise yeah otherwise you know uh, uh, it becomes anecdotal but excellent talk yeah. excellent. thank you so uh, any other comment from any of the panelists sir any final comment from you <laughs> well, i think uh, <clears throat> we had a Terrifically, you know, uh, you can say well uh, discussed sessions right from the you know initial talk, uh, which uh, Sujan covered uh, so beautifully the innovative thing, and I think we had a maximum discussion on that mm -hmm. particular part also, because uh, whenever we talk about new things, it has a lot of attachment uh, in terms of uh, how, where, when, what will happen to uh, these new procedures. But as uh, she informed us, it's already more than four or five years of her experience and giving the a list of uh, countries, people are doing that procedure. That uh, tells us that that is a procedure which people are going to do it. Any approach, any procedure which people can replicate and show the results is going to last for a long time. And innovation will come in that way only. And maybe we have, as uh, we discussed, we can have the algorithm of uh, sizing, shaping, various types of uh, cases. Wonderful discussion we had. We'll hope that we'll come out with a, you know, she'll come out with a better uh, algorithm for these cases. Also, maybe a new devices also. And as far as uh, the second talk was concerned, we all do these surgeries. A lot of uh, people do it a different technique, way, different way. And it is a well-accepted uh, procedure now for a correcting refractive error. 
not only for higher degree of cases, even for a moderate uh, error, people are doing a, a fake arrival. And that's a wonderful achievement we have got in last uh, decade or so, the confidence we have with the fake arrivals for using for a low to moderate myopia also sometimes. And especially uh, those difficult cases like post keratoconus uh, cross link cases, people are doing for uh, various other uh, ways which could not be corrected by laser refractive procedures. And a uh, day will come uh, where people opt for a you know, fake gal rather than for a laser refractive surgery on the cornea. I remember one of the ICL meets uh, where, you know, uh, 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 who is that guy uh, from Saudi Arabia? ICL. Uh, yeah. Dana Suri. Dr. Dana Suri. Well, he gave an example of uh, his daughter who had a moderate degree of effective. Both laser could be done and ICL could be done. Now, after all counseling, and she opted for a fake guy. So that shows the confidence of a person who himself doing those procedures and the people accept those procedures. So maybe uh, we, the amount of uh, surgeries uh, being done with the fake arrivals and Indian companies are coming up. The number has increased greatly in our country also. And the IPCL and other uh, upper devices, bio, the bio, biotech uh, they, these uh, results are uh, going to be as good as the ICL and the number of cases are going to increase. And my own uh, personal experience with IPCL has been with the you know, uh, fresh biopic IPCL, which I've been doing for last uh, more than three years now with the very good results of those lenses also. And they have their own uh, problems also in uh, doing surgery in a slightly older group of patients, but uh, they still work. And uh, I think that, you know, uh, better analysis of these patients will decrease the complications. I have just saw, yes, uh, three days back, one of the, my patients with ICL for last five years suddenly coming out with a sudden uh, decrease in the vision of one eye. So she had a biopic, you know, uh, a CNBM uh, behind and had a bleed. So those things should also be assessed carefully and uh, posterior segment analysis has to be done uh, regularly for these patients so that we can manage these patients before they get to a, that stage of uh, you know, uh, having a hemorrhage happening in these cases. And glaucoma part, is a, that is one thing which is uh, difficult to solve. And as far as cataract can be solved very effectively with the newer uh, devices, and we can improve their vision. But as rightly pointed out, many patients nowadays, especially younger uh, patients with glaucoma, they'll demand the, you know, uh, the newer generation multifocal or trifocals. So these are patients we have to counsel them better because they're going to live longer and their glaucoma ultimately will have some changes coming and uh, then they'll repent uh, why they had a lens which caused a decrease in a, you know, contrast and difficult analysis. But if I have an older patient, 80 plus, they demand maybe if, if they have stable glaucoma, why not to put a trifocal lens to those patients? Because their duration will be uh, for enjoying those visits will be better and we, we may not have a, too much of difficulty in these cases. But I would understand all three segments are different and they were really very good discussion in that. Thank you, sir. And uh, we had a question for Susan, which of course is uh, related to her talk that whether cares can be used for post-cataract surgery astigmatism. So I guess... Uh, I guess that's too far-fetched. That's a too far-fetched kind of a thing. Maybe uh, some laser corneal procedure will be a better option in those cases. Yeah. yeah. I think, uh, yeah, because... So that, uh, that was something uh, yeah. asked by Dr. Sharad Patil, who himself does a lot of uh, such surgeries. So we just uh, maybe might have thought that maybe we can discuss on that. So uh, big thanks to all the... Because why why not? You know, it can be used in a cases where you have done a cataract surgery for ectasia. Yeah. To do uh, such cases, you know, there it may be useful to smoothen yeah, the, you know. Basically, uh, related, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yes, that's true. Ectasia with cataract surgery, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, thanks to all the three speakers, Dr. Susan, Dr. Himanshu and Dr. Arup, the three panelists, Dr. Vijay, Dr. Anjum and Dr. Palla. And... Uh, 
thanks to uh, the it team by led by bageshwar and uh, staff anil kumar and the uh, supporter the support company ipka for and their uh, it team so thank you very much thanks to all of you and a very good night to all thank you rajesh thank you for organizing it thank you so much thank you sir dr titi yeah.